Take the time to <clears throat> see each other if you feel like it. Hello. Yay. to see you. at the time of the Buddha, there were, uh, you know, so many monks and nuns and lay people involved, you know, in the Sangha, in the community, in the teachings, the dispensation, many of whom you know will never know who they were at the time or what role they played a good number of whom you know we have their names and maybe little bits of information about who they might have been and and then there are some where you have a little more of a biography a little more of a narrative um, often it's still pretty skeletal and sparse, but can be really moving sometimes to um, find some sources of information of some of them and hear some of the words that might have been attributed to them and understand their stories. And there's one nun who is still very beloved and deeply regarded. Uh, and um, I thought I'd offer a few things from what we have of her words and her story. Patachara. One of many people who are said to have become a fully enlightened arahant during their time of practice under the Buddha's direct guidance and someone who, you know, she herself had a large following of students and um, disciples. And it seems like there was some structure, you know, of that for sure, you know, that the Buddha had, of course, sort of this pinnacle of authority, but there were a lot of sanghas um, in different places and different leaders and different teachers and um, people who had the responsibility of, of guiding their fellow monastics as well as other lay people in the practice and in the path. And Patachara was someone who uh, had a kind of grew up in a very comfortable situation, but had a, a number of um, tragedies befall her at different times. And I won't go into all the details, but she she left home, she fell in love with a servant um, of her household and knew that that would not be approved of by her family. And so she and this man went and lived together and started a family. And um, over time, um, basically everyone in her family died. He died, her children died. She tried to go back to her birth family and found they had all died. And um, it's something that happened in kind of quick enough um, succession that it had a very disturbing impact on her and um, really drove her mad um, and a very desperate, agonized um, I don't know if she, they would have even called it a search, but just meandering and lost in uh, the wilderness of, of her own despair. And um, at some point, 
came upon the Buddha. And she talks about it a little bit right here. Both of my sons have passed away. My husband is dead on the road. Mother and father and brothers are burning on a single pyre. I grew pale and thin, helpless. I was in a low state of mind. After that, while roaming, I saw him, the charioteer of men. One of the euphemisms of the Buddha. <laughs> and then the teacher said this to me, do not grieve, child. Breathe easily. You should search after your own self. Why uselessly torment yourself? There are no sons to give shelter, no fathers or even relatives. There is no shelter with family when one is seized by the end maker. After hearing the sage's speech, I realized the first path fruit, having gone forth as a nun. In no long time, I achieved my arahantship. It's talked about in, you know, the commentaries of um, just how powerfully she was consoled by the Buddha's gentleness. That coming into his field of metta and compassion was so soothing for her. that she was also able to hear the truth of the Dhamma. How powerful and beautiful that is. You know, we, we get different little slices of the Buddha and uh, other realized beings and the tradition. And sometimes they can be very severe. And sometimes it's hard to to tell sort of what are the kind of qualities just from the words that we receive, but it's, it's held in this way of understanding that there was something so gentle and inviting and um, soothing and comforting in his approach to her and his manner that it relaxed her in a way that was able to um, also really receive the truth of what he was saying. Right. The sense that there, there are no, like there is no, ultimate stability or refuge in family, in relationships, in people, in phenomena that are um, conditioned. You know, they arise because of conditions. They will exist for some time and then they pass away because of conditions. And we'll never find security in that. Do not grieve, child. Breathe easily. You should search after your own self. Why uselessly torment yourself? And so she um, had this incredible opening of heart and understanding of the truth and really having it sunk in very deeply became a nun and lived the life of a nun. And um, and yet still had to go through all these other layers. You know, it wasn't just immediate. Sometimes even in her story, it can sound like it all happens pretty quick, but um, something very beautiful in this other poem of hers. Plowing the fields sowing seeds in the ground, supporting partners and children, young men acquire wealth. I am accomplished in ethics and I do the teacher's bidding, being neither lazy nor restless. Why then do I not achieve quenching? I think there's something really 
wonderful in that, you know, how many of us have been sitting for how long and how good yogis do we maybe feel like we have been at times and tried, you know, tried our best and, and, and looking at this, uh, you know, pe people in the world plowing their fields, sowing their seeds, they get what they, you know, they get something from their investment. You know, they put this energy in and they get their, they're able to support their families and acquire wealth. And here I am putting in all this work, doing all the right things. Why am I not quenched? Doubt. <laughs> Having washed my feet, I took note of the water. Seeing the foot washing water flowing from high ground to low, my mind became serene, like a fine thoroughbred steed. Then taking a lamp, I entered my dwelling. Inspecting the bed, I sat on my cot. Then, grabbing a pin, I drew out the wick of the lamp. The liberation of my heart was like the quenching of the lamp. So it's her enlightenment poem. The, the commentaries explain that she was washing her feet and then as she poured the water out onto the ground, she noticed as the water sat on the ground and then sank into the sand, that she had a, a very powerful movement of the heart of understanding something about the nature of reality and the truth. And, and with that impact of that vision, she slowly went into her room and practiced. And use the force of that insight um, and whatever momentum she had built to, to overcome whatever final entanglements she had to overcome. And grabbing a pin, I drew out the wick. The liberation of my heart was like the quenching of the lamp. It's not uncommon, you know, you read in a lot of these stories also of it isn't always just, oh, you know, people are, the insight comes from the direct, you know, rising and falling of the breath or watching, uh, you know, something disappear in sort of direct experience in that way that we tend to think of it as. There's something important to recognize in that that she watched something disappear. Um, in a way that almost it has the quality of a metaphor, right? Sometimes when we're teaching and we offer stories and we offer metaphors, there are times where it may feel that um, it's just sort of flowering up the direct experience of insight. You know, some people don't. Uh, like that language as much. But me over and over again, you see in the suttas and in the, in the commentaries, it's like people witnessing something outside of themselves, but that has a profound impact that they may not fully fathom in that moment. But when they sit down and they, they sit with it and the, the truth of that has fully uh, seeped into their hearts, minds, bodies, their systems, that the liberating insight comes through that process, that extinguishment, that quenching of the fires, the burning of our restlessness and doubt and these agonizing qualities. How beautiful. And when you're doing your meditation practice, you know, where is this sense that, oh, the, the awakening is going to happen right there. You know, you're going to see something and it's going to, versus understanding how important it is to kind of this, this, the mind is mysterious as well <laughs> in terms of how insight happens. 
and that you're doing this prepare, preparatory work and, and investigating and trying to train the, train the mind to see what's happening. And yet, um, you know, the insight can happen when you're just doing something very normal, washing her feet and pouring out the dirty water. watching it slowly sink into the sand, understanding something profound about the nature of existence. And she says in the other sutta after her awakening, the teacher's been worshipped by me. I've done what the Buddha taught. The heavy load has been laid down. The ties to existence severed. The reason for which I went forth from my home into homelessness, I have now achieved that purpose, destruction of all the fetters. My defilements are now burnt up. All new existence is destroyed. Like an elephant with broken chains, I'm living without constraint. The heavy load has been laid down. Like elephants with broken chains, I am living without constraint. Hmm. So many times also, it's like we hear this, this sense of extinguishment, of quenching, of the fire going out and the dukkha, the pain of, of feeling the anxiousness, the restlessness, the worry, the doubt, the um, grief, the longing. Um, but something very beautiful about that the fire, you know, this is of course different translations will have different qualities to it, but often you do, it's not like uh, the fire has been stomped out right? It's just the fire burns itself out and, and the mind has stopped adding new fuel to it. The sense of um, extinguishment as a, as a natural process. And I think that's so beautiful and actually something so worth absorbing as much as we can, right? That actually when we stop adding fuel to it, when we stop uh, recreating, you know, the 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 conditions of of agony and fire and and tension and all of these things in our minds that actually these patterns they come to an end on themselves right that we don't need to end the thought we don't need to put an end to this wanting or this longing or it's like actually they come to an end themselves what we watch we witness so much is how much we reinvest in them how we we keep throwing more dry fuel on the fire, ready to keep burning, that we feel more comfortable, more safe in that um, tension of that burning than in the extinguishment, that that coolness is actually very scary for us. As much as we may long for it in one part of our hearts and minds, there's another part of our system that does not trust it, right? Does not trust the extinguishment, the letting go, um, because it understands that things are undependable. Things are constantly changing. Um, there isn't a constancy to phenomena. And so the mind heart does not yet trust equanimity, does not yet trust love to give it enough support and stability to bear the truth of reality. and wisely, because indeed, the equanimity is not strong enough. The love is not purified enough to actually be able to handle the truth of reality. When it is, enlightenment will happen on its own. That's not, it, the, those, those are not separate processes. And so when the mind goes to anger, goes to greed, goes to delusion, fantasy, selfing, all this construction, all this keeping the fire going to feel safe. 
we can just respect and, and, and bring that sense of tenderness and kindness and understanding that the mind qualities, right, the, the qualities of wisdom have not yet been ripened enough. And the only way to ripen is to keep going back into this fire, <laughs> keep exploring and understanding why does the mind keep doing this? What is the value that it's producing? Where is the pain? Where is the agony? What's unnecessary? Where are we tired of it? Where do we get in touch with this deeper longing of liberation? Patachara also was, a, um, as I was saying, a teacher to many. So you have her words and, and then you have a number of other nuns who attained awakening, who reference her as their teacher or other stories of, of groups of nuns receiving her teachings. Here's a, a story about a group of 30 nuns. This is a quote from her. Taking a pestle, pestle, young men pound corn, supporting partners and children. Young men acquire wealth. Do the Buddha's bidding. You won't regret it. Having quickly washed your feet, sit in a discreet place and meditate. Devoted to serenity of heart. Do the Buddha's bidding. After hearing her words, the instructions of Patachara, they washed their feet and retired to a discreet place. Devoted to serenity of heart, they did the Buddha's abiding. In the first watch of the night, they recollected their past lives. In the middle watch of the night, they purified their clairvoyance. In the last watch of the night, they shattered the mass of darkness. They rose and paid homage at her feet we have done your bidding. We shall abide honoring you as the 30 gods honor Indra, undefeated in battle. Masters of the three knowledges, we are free from defilements. That is how 30 senior nuns declared their enlightenment in the presence of Patachara. And this from another nun named Chanda before, I had fallen on evil times. No husband, no children, no relatives, friends, no way to obtain clothing and food. So taking a staff and bowl in hand, begging for alms from house to house, feverish from the cold and heat, I wandered for seven full years. Then, seeing a nun, obtaining food and drink, I approached her and said, let me go forth into homelessness. She, Patachara, from sympathy, let me go forth. Then, exhorting me, urge me on to the highest goal. Hearing her words, I did her bidding. Her exhortation was not in vain. I am a three-knowledge woman, fermentation-free. These three knowledges of um, knowledge of your past lives, of um, uh, the future existences of other people when they pass away, and clairvoyance in that way, and then of your own obstacles. Um, I love how it's how much of it is. Um, honoring this woman's need for clothes and food and basic human needs that she let her into the the sangha 
to feed her, to clothe her, to give her shelter and home, you know, and then urging her on to the highest goal. It said elsewhere, these three, um, these three things, also three, three things that most people don't know. Uh, Tevija. In early Buddhism, it explicitly triggers association with the ideas of Brahmanical Hinduism about the Triya Vidya, knowing of the three Vedas. When the nuns declare that they know three things that most don't know, they are not only making a joyful affirmation of the attainment, they are rejecting Brahminical assumptions that no woman of any caste was able to attain the three knowledges. And so you see this um, incredible, again, like with the Buddha, this tenderness, this compassion, this um, caring for suffering, but also not one that hides the nature of the truth or um, avoids it, right? This, this sense that through, it's through the caring, through the welcoming, through the gentleness, that there is a receptivity to the deepest truths, right? To feeling accepted and at home and cared for and stable and uh, in this field of, of the nuns uh, metta. If you've ever been to uh, Burma or anywhere where there's um, a group of nuns living together, practicing together, even as a, outside of that system, um, it, there's something often, I've never actually not experienced this, this palpable sense of this um, beautiful, welcoming sisterhood um, that seems to have lasted through all of these centuries. Certainly, um, certainly a different beautiful feeling than you notice in a lot of the male the monastics. But to remember that this is the doorway into the deepest and sometimes harshest truths. Here's the last poem I'll read from Patachara. Speaking to a group as a, of as many as 500 nuns. You keep crying out, my son, to that being who is coming or going somewhere else and who came from somewhere else, none of which you know. But you do not really cry for him over what you do not, over what you do know will face him wherever he is. That is just human nature. He came from there uninvited. He went from here without permission. He came from somewhere or other. He stayed a bit. From here, he went one way. From there, he will go another. A hungry ghost will be reborn as a human. He went the way he came. What is there to grieve about? And the nuns responded. She pulled out an arrow that was hard for me to see. The one that I nourished in my heart. She expelled the grief for a son, the grief that had overwhelmed me. Today, the arrow is pulled out. I am without hunger, completely free to go to the Buddha, his Dhamma, and his Sangha for refuge. I go to the sage for refuge. So a woman who herself knew the depths of loss and the agony of loss, speaking to at least 500 other women who shared some version of that agony and that pain 
it said in other places, uh, the Buddha said to her, and she, you know, would repeat this, you know, that recognizing that the, the loss that she had experienced over countless lifetimes, the, the tears she had shed over countless lifetimes were greater than the waters of the four great oceans. And that that is true for everyone. How long we have experienced loss. And yet this perspective, you do not really cry for him over what you do know will face him over what you know will face him wherever he is, right? This very powerful and kind of intense understanding of when we're grieving about loss, this recognition that it is actually not about that person. Not to say never, but to say in this case, in the sort of most simplified archetypal version of it, you don't know what's going on with that person, right? You don't know where he is now or what's happening to him or where he came from or what's going on. Your grief is about your own clinging, your own longing, your own inability to accept the instability of things. True compassion for him or whoever would feel entirely different. True love is not doesn't agonize around loss, right? The deepest metta, the deepest karuna, the deepest appreciation and equanimity are not dependent upon conditions and are not thwarted by our own fear of the nature of things, the, the truth of reality. From here, he went one way. From there, he'll go another. He went the way he came. That word is the tathagata, the way he went, the way he came, which is the way the Buddha would refer to himself all frequently. It was one of another way that they would talk about the Buddha, one thus gone, one who came the way they went. And so how powerful to really fathom that also of like, she's just talking about some random person and call and using the phrase tathagata and that you would also use the phrase as the fully enlightened you know beyond the regular arahant the buddha has this like and this idea that it's it's like it's all the same of all coming and going all conditioned how powerful and how difficult how hard it is for the heart to truly come to peace with that and how alien it can feel right that that, that degree of acceptance that degree of um peacefulness with the way things are and the nature of all phenomena. Of course, the mind longs for freedom, longs for, we want, we want relief from our fires and our agonies, but there's something about how cold that can feel that's scary, you know, the coolness of that peace. <laughs> it's not always like totally what you're like, were we going for that really? You know, like that is um, really powerful. And so while you, we recognize there might be like conscious restraint around that degree of acceptance, that degree of total peace with you know, the birth, life, and death of the people we care the most about and her acknowledgement, that is just human nature, right? This, the, the, that you don't really, you're not, your care is not really about that. This is not the care for them. This is the inability to be with the pain. Care for them is one thing, but this question of why do we associate caring about things with being upset about them, right? And that somehow if you're not upset about some Thing horrible that happens or the loss of something you love. If you're not upset about it, this idea that it means you don't care. And what a horrible conflation of ideas that is. And how profound it is to, to understand the possibility that actually the deepest caring, the only true caring is actually not attached. Because as soon as there's attachment, then the caring isn't about the object anymore. Right? It's about the, the, the arrow in the heart that we've been nourishing.
the responsibility that we have to take for our, our hearts and minds with that. We wouldn't be doing this practice, you know, if we didn't feel like it, there was um, something in it for us. Not that we can't lose track of that at times and have this experience of doubt, you know, just like Patachara did of, you know, I've been doing all this and what is it leading to? And is this the freedom I want, et cetera? And I think there's the, 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 the deepest faith, well, I don't know what the deepest, but a very profound degree of faith in the practice and in this path has to do with how it's really only about the truth. You know, we're, we're giving you method and suggesting ideas of how to stay connected with what's happening. Try this, try this, learn how to back off, learn, you know, all of the method. But all of it is just about trying to be with what's, what is, right? There's, there's nothing that we're saying like, change this, do change, make this something else. Um, you know, what you're seeing is wrong and, and what you need to see is some other thing that is not arisen. And there's something about that in Vipassana practice that I think makes it so trustworthy that you know on some fundamental level, all there's nothing fabricated in this. It's just trying to be with reality and with the way things are internally and externally in the heart and mind and body and the sense doors. And there's something there that's uncorruptible in its um, ultimate sense, right? That there's, you can only, uh, if you're making adjustments, if you are trying to manipulate, it's very obvious, it becomes very evident over time. And so this sense of the purity of the um, motivation is not only in the goal of liberation, the goal of freedom and peace of heart and mind and uh, ability to care for beings in all directions without restraint, but also just um, as someone was saying today in an interview, just respecting the truth. That you expect, we respect the truth. And that's, that can be all we need for our motivation. It doesn't need to be anything more than that. And how hard it is to actually be in relationship, honest relationship with the truth. When we come to sit especially after some days and you know you're there's more um, concentration, there's more the mindfulness therefore has a little more of a vehicle to be in relationship with experiences for maybe a little bit longer, a little bit more clearly. We do often come to see just how defended against the truth we are. Um, we see how much thought there is, right? Just this sort of like incredible um, resistance and interruption and getting in the way of just watching the breath, you know? <laughs> I mean, it, there's, you, we sometimes have to have humor with like how many years and how many sittings and, you know, how much effort have we put in and just like, just trying to sit there and watch something so simple, like the rising and falling of the abdomen, you know, it's so hard, you know, the mind is still just like, wow, going everywhere, you know. But how important it is to see that. We, it's like, at some point, yes, there's the method and there's concentration, there's all these things that are important 
to understanding, okay, come back to the breath, come back to your anchor, come back to this, do some metta. Da, da. It's like, yes, we need to kind of get some space from that. And this, this truth of bringing the mind into what we're observing, right? That we're not trying to just avoid the mind or suppress the mind to, so that we can watch the breath, you know, or watch the lifting, moving, placing. It isn't about that. It's like that there are skills that are built in that. There's insight that can come from that. But there's also insight that comes from being able to watch the mind and watch the restlessness, this thing about the thoroughbred horse, right? This like, this, this language was used a lot of just the, the wildness of it, you know? And what is it when it's trained, right? When the direction is clear and unified and, um, you know, not even in so much of the old days of how they would talk about breaking a horse in, but the, you know, these more sensitive and newer understandings of what is it, what is the relationship with something like a horse that we develop in its training so that there's trust and independence, uh, trust and determination without violence, right? Without feeling like it's in a prison. What is this process of building trust with the mind? And part of that has to be this basic acceptance of the total panic that is at the heart of becoming, at the heart of our existence, of, of the, the heart of our uh, building and adding fuel to this fire. The mind is terrified of the undependability of things, right? Rightfully so, right? It's You sit there and you watch and you, you try to simply watch how things are going and it is wild. This relentless torrent of experience unfolding at the six sense doors. Thank goodness there's only six, you know? If we had more, it's like unbearable. And this language to be careful of like, oh, the present moment, you know, just come back to the present moment and the present moment as this sort of salvatory uh, place of like inherent wisdom and inherent goodness, not true. The present moment is a nightmare. That is what, if it was so great, we wouldn't be running from it all the time because that's 90% of what the mind is doing is running from it. Thinking about this, thinking about that, and just like trying to get away from the instability of the present moment and the flood of fabrication happening in that, in this instantly and incredibly fleeting experience. So that sense of what there is a deepening faith in the possibility of equanimity with formations, deepening faith in the possibility of acceptance of the truth of things, of love and wisdom as protections. Protections uh, that don't need defense against the truth of things. And again, until those protections are perfected, the mind needs these defenses to stay stable, to feel safe, to feel like it can deal with this unrelenting torrent of experience. And many folks are, it's like, you know, going through these, it's like moments where you settle down, you know, where the mind does get quiet for a moment. And there's just this like calm. It doesn't need to be like, overwhelming peace or overwhelming anything. It's just like, oh, we notice the mind has settled. And then we watch it. It's like, th start planning, start thinking, start, find something to worry about. Like find something to grab onto because this, this sort of space, this sort of neutral, this, this quietude can feel terrifying. It's, it is not state, it doesn't feel solid enough. And indeed it isn't solid. And so it's like the sense that the mind is always looking for solidity as a way of, of feeling safe, of feeling grounded. It's like, we have to have compassion for that. We have to understand, of course, you know? So we both get that taste of like, oh, a moment of 
this is fine. Things are fine. And then to watch the mind go. And, and you can sometimes see it look for one thing and it's not enough. It's like, ah, oh, that. I'm going to go after that. And it'll find the thing that really is going to hook you. You know, the thing that's really going to get you planning or wanting or aversive or whatever. And to be able to watch that rather than being like, God, why doesn't the mind just rest in this place? You know, why does it have to do that? It's like, can we be genuinely interested in why? Can we see, oh gosh, it is providing a sense of security, of solidity, of um, stableness, a platform. How much of it is just views, right? Whether it's our sense of self or just how much we rehearse our views. We rehearse our arguments about whatever in our lives or in the world. It doesn't mean that they're wrong, but you clearly don't need to keep doing it over and over to remember. You know, you would remember. If... <laughs> and, and so like, why now? Why does this have to keep doing? And it's like, okay, yes, you can. it's okay to feel frustrated with the mind, of course. To just be like exasperated, you know. Can you find humor in it at times? Can there be a place of like, God, this is so nuts. And then where is there some sympathy? Where can we attune to like, oh, if I keep doing it, boy, it sure feels solid. It sure feels um, coherent. It feels like there's a me. And as painful as this me is, at least it's there. You know, at least I'm real. At least I, I know where I am in relationship to all of the things, whatever they are, you know. Mm. How hard it is and how much compassion is then needed, right? The sense of like, wit, when, when Patachara comes to the Buddha, when Chanda comes to Patachara, the sense of like, they're at their wit's end. Beyond, you know, Patachara means something like, one who doesn't recognize the use of clothes well, because she was naked. She was just wild, running wild through the streets naked. Um, you know, had like just come to the most extreme place of disorientation and agony. You know, and did, did the Buddha or did Patachara, you know, was their response like, what is wrong with you? Everything's impermanent. Don't you know that? You know, no. Like, don't you know that yet? How many people have to die before you recognize that? You know, it's like, no, that wasn't that attitude at all. It's this like, oh, come in. Let's feed you. Let's clothe you. Let's take care of you. Let's make sure you have what you need, that you feel welcome, that you know we totally understand what you're going through because we have all gone through it because any of those arahants any of those fully enlightened beings it's like that they've had to that it is the only way you get to full equanimity is through facing the full agony of the mind's resistance to reality the mind's resistance to dukkha with the insecurity and instability of life it's the only way that that love, again, becomes unrestrained through totally understanding and not being attached in our caring. So that generosity of heart that is brought in to these suffering people and that allowed them to feel the, the safety and the security and the nourishment and the care and provide a platform for which they could then experience the truth. Hold the pain and the agony and the, the torture of loss and of longing and of fear, terror, of instability, all of these things. And so for us, it, it won't happen until we can have that same response with the patachara inside of us, with the chanda inside of us, right? Where that part of ourselves of, of that's so afraid and so scared and, and acting in ways that are harmful, right, to ourselves or to others, that we can totally welcome it with love, totally understanding, oh, God, yes, like, 
I absolutely know how painful this is. What does he say? Do not grieve, child. Breathe easily. This care, this compassion, that's also knowing, right? That also is wise and stable, understanding how hard this is. And so that sense of like, knowing that we have to play both parts, you know? That we have to get in touch with the uh, parts of ourselves that are so discombobulated and so terrified and agonized and restless beyond comprehension, you know? We're so grieved, so lonely, so angry, so resentful, so whatever. And that we keep coming up against it. <laughs> we keep coming up until the response is also more and more purified. We've been through it so many times um, that there's a deep friendship in it, this deep love and compassion that comes out of familiarity and intimacy. Oh, this pain, right? When the Buddha says it to her or when she says it to another nun, it isn't your pain, it isn't, it's like pain, we know pain. We know agony, we know suffering and hardship, we know longing, we know peace, we know the truth, we know the way, the path that leads to this truth. And so there is something like these fires that I think on some level we do have to understand as the awakening path and practice is natural. And actually, once you're on it to this degree, there is something inevitable about the liberation. And there's some part of mindfulness that can't get turned off um, not to say we can't make mistakes, not to say that we can't um, create fuel to our fires th that make it harder to see clearly, that add to our troubles and difficulties along the path. Of course we can. But with mindfulness, right, with this relationship, with the tenderness of approach and simply trying to observe very close, very open, you know, very near, very far with energy or with sleepiness, you know, whatever conditions are arising, there is something natural about the process of these fires coming to an end, All right? The fire extinguishes itself and the more sensitivity, the more compassion, the more care we just keep bringing to it, right? We see it in a moment that some fire that's arisen, some agony, it's like when, when held, when witnessed, when cared for, when truly acknowledged and also not tinkered with, that it comes to an end. We may very often see ourselves pick up a new fire a new hot coal. We'll see ourselves do that a lot. But we'll also start to see the place where oh, we trust the space a little bit more. One fire goes out in the mind and that coolness and that relief, we recognize how nourishing it is. We're not just afraid of it. 
We don't necessarily just feel lost in it or annihilated by it, but there's a relief in that extinguishment and something coming to an end. And the mind's peace with that becomes a, a guiding force to keep bringing metta, to keep bringing compassion, keep bringing wisdom and appreciation for all of the goodness in our lives. Again, without attachment, how liberating that is. When will we also feel like a herd of elephants, unchained, freely liberated in the forest of samsara? Very soon, I'm sure. Let's just sit for a moment. So we have some time for walking or washing your feet before the metta chanting and sitting. Mm. Take good care.